Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Mel Elfin, who died recently at the age of 89, and he's definitely had a significant impact on our culture. He was a longtime editor at Newsweek and later on at U.S. News and World Report. And while he was at U.S. News and World Report, he refined their system of college rankings. And the U.S. News and World Report college ranking system is now the standard by which all other college ranking systems are measured. Mel Elfin was a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn. And in 1964, he attracted the attention of Catherine Graham, the publisher of the Washington Post and of Newsweek. little background here, Catherine Graham was the daughter of Eugene Meyer, the publisher of the Washington Post. She married Philip Graham, brilliant guy from the Harvard Law School, and her father made him the publisher of the Washington Post after they got married. He was quite successful at it. He turned the Washington Post into a national newspaper while she was mainly a social doyenne. The only problem was Philip Graham was, well, today I guess we would say he was probably bipolar and had an alcohol problem. And although he was friends with people like John Kennedy, he started running around on Catherine Graham with his girlfriend and threatened to take the newspaper completely away from her. In 1963, that was a public scandal in Washington, and at the height of the tensions, he had a breakdown, was hospitalized, and after he was discharged from the hospital, he committed suicide, which put the ownership of the Post into question. It's a well-known story now how Catherine Grant stepped up from not knowing anything about the newspaper to taking control of both the Post and Newsweek. This is where Mel Elfin comes in. In 1964, Catherine Graham's main priority was to find an editor for the Washington Post, and she selected from the Washington Bureau of Newsweek, Ben Bradley, he of later on Watergate fame. To replace Ben Bradley at Newsweek in the Washington Bureau, she selected Mel Elfin, who had captured her attention with some witty toasts. As the Washington Bureau editor of Newsweek, Mel Elfin ran a powerhouse division that competed successfully with Time Magazine. He hired people like Eleanor Clift and Howard Feynman, and while feared by many, he was quite successful. Eventually, the feuds caught up with him, and in 1985, he had to move on to U.S. News & World Report. At U.S. News & World Report, they had been doing college rankings for a couple years, but what he did was he made that a prime feature of the magazine. He made it more scientific. He put a lot of money into it. It immediately became a top circulation feature, and gradually, other magazines started emulating it. More importantly... Colleges, college presidents, college admission offices started looking at it, looking at how they were rated, looking at how they could boost their ratings, and then parents and students started looking at it as well. And remember, we're not just talking in the United States, we're talking worldwide. It's to the point today where colleges have changed their admission criteria, their selection criteria, how much importance they put on standardized exams, how much importance they put on grades, based on what it will do to their rankings in the U.S. News and World Report. It can truly be said that Mel Elfin changed the entire industry of college admissions. We're going to move on now to Tommy McDonald, who died recently at the age of 84. Great football player. I had his football card when I was a little boy. He was a running back at Oklahoma for Bud Wilkinson in the mid-50s. He was part of their great teams in the mid-50s and won 47 straight games. He was in 31 of them. He never lost a college game. He went on to play in the pros for the Philadelphia Eagles and became one of the great receivers in NFL history. Even though he was small, he ran precise routes, and he could catch anything that was thrown near him. He was part of the great Eagles team that won the NFL championship in 1960, beating my Packers 17-13, to the first game I ever watched on television. Here's Tulsa Television. One of OU football's all-time greats, Tommy McDonald, two times an All-American, Two times a national champion, died today at the age of 84. After helping the Sooners go 31-0 and in his three seasons playing for Bud Wilkinson, McDonald became a star at the NFL level, six times making the Pro Bowl, leading the Philadelphia Eagles to an NFL championship in 1960. At the time of his induction in 1998, McDonald was the smallest man in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, 5'9", 178 pounds. Big personality, incredible career, Sooner legend. Here's a rundown of Tommy's career with the Eagles including his Hall of Fame induction where he threw his bust up in the air and caught it. His personality was unique and unmistakable. His contributions to the Eagles were immeasurable. McDonald accumulated almost 5,500 yards and 66 touchdowns in seven seasons with the Eagles from 1957 to 1963. That's over 19 yards per reception. And for 57 years, the 1960 team was the standard for success in Philadelphia. McDonald scored a touchdown in the snow at Franklin Field as the Eagles beat the Packers 17-13. to 
leading to some high praise from Vince Lombardi. He okay. said, you give me 11 Tommy McDonald's and I'll win the championship every year. And that even takes precedence over the Hall of Fame. It took 30 years to get McDonald into the Hall of Fame. And he would only go in his way. Did you plan on doing what you did when you got up to the rostrum to speak to the people? Yeah. Dropping the bust? Not dropping it. I well, cut, throwing yeah. it up in the air throwing and it up catching in the air, it. Yes. Yeah. Well, when I picked it up and I realized it was it weighed, must have weighed about 65 pounds, and I said, oh, my gosh. I said, what have you done? But you got to go through with this, you know. So I used to have good hands, so I threw it up in the air and then caught it. Chest bumping and everything with Singletary and the Paul Krauss and every, all of that. Uh, you you got to enjoy life. Well, we have to talk a little bit about that 1960 championship game. That was the last Eagles football championship until they won the 20. 17 Super Bowl. The 1960 NFL Championship was the only championship game Vince Lombardi ever lost. Tommy McDonald caught the first touchdown pass in that game, by the way. Great players on that team. McDonald was the star receiver for Norm Van Brocklin, the Dutchman. And they also had Chuck Bednarik, the last two-way player in the NFL. We did his podcast. He was the one who stopped Jimmy Taylor on the 10-yard line on the last play of the game. Here's Tommy McDonald to talk a little bit about it. Uh, you know the individuals that we had on the 1960 team, like a Van Brockton personality. you got to have a Chuck Bettnerick personality, a Tom Brookshire personality, Ted Dean personality. People do not realize that personalities really can play a major part in the winning. We just knew that we had the material to go win a championship. And we just kept telling ourselves that all the time. And the coach just backed us up. And that's what you need, is the coach backing you up. And that's how we won the championship. But that's how we got that little, little ring right there. That helped us win that by having the right coaches and we had uh, the right quarterbacks and we had the right players. Again, Van Brocklin goes back and looks for McDonald. Tommy's open on the seventh to take Van Brocklin's pass into the end zone for the first touchdown of the game. Bobby Walston ends the point, and the Eagles go ahead, seven to six. Van Brocklin called the play, and I says, I, I, I think I can get it, Van. I, I, in fact, I think I can get it in the end zone. So uh, I took off for the post. Just as then as I saw him turn his body, I spun around and headed back to the corner. And my guards, I was so wide open, it wasn't even funny. And Van Brocklin just laid it right in there, perfect. In fact, they had oversold the crowd so much that they had people were actually on on floor of the stadium and stuff like that. You can see them on the floor of the stadium. Let me tell you, I was so proud because I just felt like you know the by me getting the end zone, it just juiced up our our chance of getting the game. He throws a short pass to Jim Taylor. Taylor brings the crowd to its feet as he nearly gets loose, but Chuck Bednarik grabs him on the ten, and that's the end of the line. The Philadelphia Eagles have won the world championship of professional football with the same come-from-behind heroics that earned them their conference title. The birds outlast the rugged Packers in one of the hardest-fought contests ever witnessed. We're going to move on now to our feature, Martin Buckwald, a.k.a. Marty Balin, who died recently at the age of 76. Marty Balin was a founding member of the top West Coast 1960s acid rock group, Jefferson Airplane. He was the third podcast we've done on a Jefferson Airplane member. Sometime back within a month, we did another founding member, Paul Kantner, and their original girl singer, Signe Anderson. But I'm going to venture to say that Marty Balin was the most talented of anyone in the Jefferson Airplane, considering his songwriting and his great voice. His story is an archetypical one, nice Jewish boy born in Cincinnati, and after the war, his family moved to San Francisco. Growing up in Northern California in the 50s, he was interested in art and music, and when he was a teenager, he wanted to get into music, and the music to get into in San Francisco in the late 50s and early 60s was folk music. Folk music was competing with jazz and rock for dominance at that point, and San Francisco was the West Coast hub of folk music, the Hungry Eye and all that stuff. After cutting a few unsuccessful records on his own, he became the lead singer of a folk group called the Town Criers, and this is what they sounded like in 1964. And when I roll on, I really roll on, oh daddy really rolls on. But in 
1964, he and Paul Cantor were watching television, and then they went to the movies, and they saw A Hard Day's Night. And if there was one thing that drove the nail in the coffin of folk music more than anything else, it was the movie A Hard Day's Night. Roger McGuinn and David Crosby were in L.A., and they talked about the same phenomenon. They went to A Hard Day's Night, and they said, we're getting out of folk, and we're getting into rock. We told the story of the Jefferson Airplane founding in the Paul Cantner podcast, and the rock of Northern California was a little harder edge than that of Southern California or anywhere else in the country. And it was suffused early on with LSD. Remember, this is also where Stanley Owsley, whose podcast we've done, and Ken Kesey were hanging out. Hence the term acid rock, although Marty Balin did not partake of it. But the sound Marty Balin and Paul Cantor put together with the rest of the Jefferson Airplane, along with that of his friend Janis Joplin, embodied West Coast Northern California acid rock in 1966 and 1967. This is what it sounded like with Marty Balin in the lead. And this is only about three years after that folk song. Do I That was three-fifths of a mile in ten seconds, which Marty Balin wrote for the album Surrealistic Pillow, one of the groundbreaking albums of the 1960s that heralded acid rock. At that point, the Jefferson Airplane were one of the top groups in the country. What could go wrong? Well, the peace and love people weren't immune to the vicissitudes everybody else was, and in this case, it was jealousy. Signe Anderson had a baby, didn't want to travel with the group anymore, so they took on a new girl singer from the Great Society, Grace Slick. And she became the star and the lead singer, and that didn't set well with Marty Balin. She brought over a couple of her songs, including White Rabbit and Somebody to Love. And that was sort of the unraveling of Marty Balin with the original Jefferson Airplane. They came back as the Jefferson Starship, and he did some songs for them among his best. Their biggest hit in the 1970s was this one that he wrote and sang. crazy about that song, but the next two songs are among my favorites, and they're the reason I think Marty Balin was the most talented of all of them. These are two great rock songs. The first is Hearts. Hearts and brain, never This one's one of the best songs of the 70s, Count On Me. This love I give to you, you will stand deep in the eyes of the world. Close on that note, I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Taps, and we're going to close with a brief mention of Joe Masteroff, who died recently at the age of 98, and his career wasn't particularly distinguished except for one thing. He adapted Christopher Isherwood's book, The Berlin Stories, into the musical Cabaret, which ran for almost 1,200 performances on Broadway and was made into the classic movie starring Liza Minnelli and Joel Gray. And speaking of Joel Gray, we're going to honor Joe Masteroff with that opening number from Cabaret by Joel Gray, a haunting introduction, Bill Common. Bill Common, yes, and you, Bill Common, happy to see you, bleib a rest is dead. Bill Common, yes, and you, Bill Common, im Cabaret, au Cabaret, to Cabaret.